Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session on public health for women and girls. My name is Kate Namacher, and I am the Vice President of Education at NHF. And we are extremely excited to be pulling this amazing panel together today to talk about this really important issue for our community and broadly the, the blood disorders community overall. Um, this, this whole presentation and session would not be possible without the amazing partnership of all of the organizations listed here who really helped um, come together, begin this sharing of knowledge and ideas, um, and really came together to do the recruitment to have an amazing panel here today. So thank you to the National Blood Clot Alliance, Cooley's Anemia Foundation, the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders, Hemophilia Federation of America, and the Center for Inherited Bleeding Disorders and Health and Human Services Regional Offices. So thank you all for being here today. A few quick tips to really make the most of this session as a participant. You will see um, on your screen that there is a chat box, and that is the way where you'll be able to engage and write questions in. Your panelists will actually be able to respond to those questions throughout the session, so if something comes up that you hear and want to jot it down, go ahead and write it into that chat box. Um, so please make sure to use that, and we'll save some time at the end for additional um, chat through and Q&A through the chat box. Um, we also strongly encourage everybody to fill out our evaluation, um, so you'll be getting more information about how to do that and links to fill out the evaluation form, but we absolutely really use that feedback to better shape our meetings moving forward, and particularly on this topic, we'd love to be able to consider, continue to do more for this. We'd love to hear what you would really want to see and hear um, to make this as, meaning, as meaningful as possible for the community. Um, finally, all of these presentations um, during our Bleeding Disorders Conference are being recorded, so you'll be able to um, watch this at another time or be able to share for those who weren't able to make it to this session today. And with that, I am going to hand it over to our next speaker. So I would like to welcome Rachel Rosofsky, MD, MPH, the Director of Thrombosis Research in the Department of Hematology at Mass General Hospital, our assist Assistant Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, who is here to, um, you know, on behalf of the National Blood Clot Alliance, but really to share more about women and blood clots. Thank you, Dr. Rosofsky. Well, I would just like to thank the National Hemophilia Foundation for inviting me, uh, as well as the National Blood Clot Alliance uh, to present them, uh, represent them. Um, I think this is a wonderful topic, and I'm thrilled to be uh, on this panel with so many great speakers. So these are my disclosures, uh, institutional research support from Janssen and BMS, and advisory consultant from Portola, BMS, Janssen, and Dova. So the agenda for today, uh, I'm going to go through a case, uh, definitions, talk about the scope of the problem, risk factors, treatment, and end with prevention and awareness. So to start with the case, this is a 20-year-old uh, college junior who presented to her institutional health service complaining of two days of progressive right calf pain. Her pain was so severe that it was actually very difficult for her to walk and she was told that she probably pulled a muscle. And she actually said to them, I haven't worked out, so I'm not sure how I would pull a muscle. Nevertheless, they told her to use heat and ibuprofen, but they did make a follow-up for her for three days later. The following evening, she became very short of breath, and she called the health services back, uh, and she was told to follow up with her regular planned uh, follow-up visit. Fortunately, she did not take that advice. She called her mother, and her mother was quite concerned about her symptoms and advised her to go to her local emergency room. When she got there, they were concerned by the fact that she had had a calf in one of her, uh, a pain in one of her calves that then uh, developed into shortness of breath, and they were worried about a pulmonary embolism. So they did a workup, and in fact, she indeed had pulmonary emboli in both sides of her lungs. It's important to note that she had started oral contraceptives just two months prior, and on top of that, she had a family history of blood clots. So what is a blood clot? So blood clots can form in deep veins, mostly in a person's leg, but sometimes in the arms and other locations, and it's called a deep vein thrombosis, or DVT. And they cause symptoms by blocking flow of blood through the vein. That causes swelling, that causes pain, that causes redness. And if those are untreated, they can move or break off and travel to the lungs, and that's when they can become life-threatening. 
and that is called a pulmonary embolism, or PE. Now, why is this a problem? Well, one in four deaths worldwide is related to a blood clot or a thrombosis. And in the United States, VTE, or venous thromboembolism, is the third leading cause of cardiovascular death. There's more than 2 million DVTs every year, 600,000 PEs, and 100,000 deaths from PE. And the estimated cost is $1.5 billion a year. More people die of a PE than breast cancer, car crashes, and AIDS combined. And on top of that, it is the number one preventable cause number one cause of preventable deaths in hospitalized patients in the United States. That is a remarkable statement to make. And you can see here that this problem is not going away. The incidence is increasing, and there are a number of reasons for that. First of all, people are living longer. Your risk of getting a blood clot in your 20s is about 1 in 10,000, and in your 80s is about 1 in 100. We also know that obesity is a big risk factor, and you can see here over time that the number of incidence of PEs going up uh, due to uh, obesity. And I also just want to point out that this pregnancy line initially went down in the early 90s, but has plateaued, and we have had no changes in pulmonary emboli caused by pregnancy. The other important factor to know about DVT and PE is that no one is immune. From the youngest to the oldest to the most out of shape person to Serena Williams, arguably one of the most fit athletes probably in the world, has had two blood clots. Jerome Kersey was an NBA star, died after having knee surgery. And Chris Bosch, he has to give up his uh, career with, my, uh, with Miami in the, uh, after his second VTE. You may remember NC, uh, NBC correspondent David Bloom, died of a blood clot. Um, Frida Kahlo, Mexican artist. And Heavy D, the rapper, died of a PE. Hillary Clinton has had a PE. I'm from Massachusetts, so David Andrews is a uh, player for the Patriots, he had a PE. And most recently, I'm not sure if you've seen this in the news, it was actually in the New England Journal, there was an astronaut in space that got a blood clot. So it really doesn't matter your age, um, how, how fit you are, what you do for a living, anything, it can cross all of those boundaries. Now what's unique for women is that women throughout their lives uh, face a series of blood clotting challenges unique to their gender, and that's pregnancy and childbirth, hormone therapy for birth control, which can be a pill, a patch, or a ring, or hormone therapy used to treat menopause. And the common factor connecting all of these increased risks to getting blood clots is estrogen. Women can also have genetic and inherited risk factors that actually increase their risk even more. If you look at the likelihood of developing a blood clot, you can see here at the very top of this graph that if you're not pregnant and you're not using OCs, which is all contraceptives, your risk or likelihood of getting a blood clot is one in five per 10,000 women years. If you're using a combined all contraceptive, so that's estrogen and progesterone, it's three to nine per 10,000 women years. If you're on this progesterone, only the drosperidone, it's 10 per 10,000 women years. And look at this, if you're pregnant, that likelihood of getting a blood clot goes up to five to 20 per 10,000 women years. And if you're postpartum, which is the highest risk, it goes to 40 to 65 per 10,000 women years. So most women can take hormonal birth control safely and experience no complications. However, hormonal birth control in any form, so the pill, the patch, the ring, can place women at an increased risk for blood clots. Most forms of birth control will contain estrogen and the synthetic progesterone or progestin, and that can cause the body to hormonally imitate a pregnancy. And this is what actually prevents pregnancy, but at the same time, that is what increases the risk of clotting. The combined contraceptives increase the clotting risk two to three times that of non-users that I just showed you on that other graph. And the risk can be even higher in women that have other risk factors or, or predisposed to clotting disorders. Other risk factors of women who are on oral contraceptives can include smoking and over the age of 35, can be postpartum period, can be in women who have had major surgery with prolonged immobilization, much higher if you've had a history of DVT or PE, if you have an underlying hereditary risk for getting blood clots, if you have an overwhelming inflammatory condition like inflammatory bowel disease, 
or surgery or immobilization or steroid use. There's also increased risk in people that have lupus with what's called an antiphospholipid antibody, which is a protein that some people make that predisposes them to getting blood clots. Progestin-only contraceptives in the form of pill or IUD and implant generally do not increase the blood clot risk. It's important for women to work with their healthcare providers to assess what their clotting risk is when they're thinking about birth control options and to take several of these factors into account. Number one, have they ever had a blood clot? Or do they have a family history of blood clots? Do they have an underlying clotting disorder? Have they recently been pregnant? And really talking about them and coming through shared decision-making on what their lifestyle preferences are for contraception. And at the same time, it's very important for the patient and the healthcare provider to explore other medical risks that might increase their risk of clotting. And those can include hospitalization or surgery recently, if patients have cancer or on some kind of cancer therapies, if they've had any injury or physical trauma, like fractures or burns, immobility can increase your risk, and obesity is a big risk factor, as I showed you in one of the earlier slides. So going back to our patient, she's a junior, she was just diagnosed with her pulmonary embolism. What are her options for contraception? And really, it has to do with why was she on the birth control in the first place? Was it for contraception or was it for heavy menses or was it for endometriosis or something else? In general, when people have been uh, develop a blood clot on estrogen, you want to not use the estrogen chain products. So our options would be a barrier method, spermicides, IUD, usually the copper one. There's also progestin only. The marina is the, cop is the progestin IUD, pills, implant. The Depo-Provera does increase the risk of clotting in patients that have already had blood clots. I would not recommend that. And then if she were not childbearing, she could think about tubal ligation. So one question I often get is if somebody's had a blood clot and they've been on estrogen-containing products, can they go back on those? And again, it goes back to the question as to why she was on it in the first place. If she had horrible endometriosis and this was the only way to control that, then I would keep her on estrogen, but I would also keep her on the blood thinner. I would not advise that she go on any estrogen-containing products without being on a blood thinner. What about if she wants to get pregnant? Well, the increased tendency to clot during pregnancy is actually the body's natural biological response intended to protect women against potentially dangerous bleeding that can happen during childbirth and miscarriages. And hormonal changes during pregnancy cut changes in the blood flow, blood volume, blood composition, and it increases a woman's risk of clotting higher than if she was not pregnant. And in fact, the risk is greatest in the three months after the baby is born, and also greatest risk in C-sections. So this was a, um, a study that looked at the risk factors of pregnancy-associated thrombosis based on something called the RCOG risk assessment the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. And you can see here that if you have a C-section, it's probably the highest risk of getting a blood clot. That's followed by obesity, if you have bottom body mass index greater than 30, you've had multiple kids, multiple medical comorbidities, age greater than 35, family history, if you've had a prior blood clot. Those are gonna put you at a higher risk of getting a blood clot. And it's really important for women who are planning um, who are either pregnant or planning a pregnant to work with their healthcare providers to really assess what their risk is and then manage it. And this is often done through a multidisciplinary group of people, not just hematologists, but we get OB involved uh, and really try to think about what the best way is to protect these women. Now, if it turns out that women do need to be on some kind of blood thinner during and after their pregnancy, they can be, there are safe treatments or safe anticoagulant options available. Those include unfractionated heparin, low microlet heparin, and fondaparinox. And the dose will really depend on the reason for having the patient on that anticoagulant. If it's somebody that's had a prior blood clot and you want to prevent them getting another one during and after their pregnancy, it's usually a prophylactic dose. If they have lots of risk factors, it might be a higher dose than that. In women that uh, become pregnant and they were on a blood thinner already, they were on that blood thinner long-term and it was treatment dose, they would be continued on treatment dose. So this is kind of a controversial area and did it, there's lots of different guidelines and organizations that have um, help in determining which type of uh, anticoagulant to use and what, and what dose. Warfarin is not used in pregnant women as it can cause harm to the fetus 
And the newer anticoagulants called the direct oral anticoagulants, or DOEX, have not been studied. And so they're not thought to be safe during pregnancy or breastfeeding. They actually cross the, potentially cross the placenta, so they should not be used during this time. So going back to our patient, the 20-year-old college junior with history of PE, her mother is going through menopause and is having a lot of hot flashes. So what are her mother's risks of getting a blood clot? And what are her options to treat her menopausal symptoms? So hormone treatments usually contain one or more of the female hormones, estrogen usually plus one of those progesterone or progestin only. Um, and they're used to manage menopausal symptoms, mood changes, hot flashes, vaginal dryness. And the presence of estrogen in these therapies, which include the pills, the patches, the rings, and even the vaginal creams, those can increase your risk of blood clots. So women who are considering hormonal therapy to treat their menopausal symptoms really need to work with their healthcare providers and assess their risk. And in assessing their risk, consider their own personal risk of clotting and whether or not they've had any family history and all the risk factors. Now, fortunately, we have options other than this to treat menopausal symptoms. So going back to our patient's mother, given the fact that her daughter had a blood clot and there's a family history of blood clots, I would not advise that she use any estrogen-containing products to manage her menopausal symptoms. But menopausal symptoms can be relieved without hormone therapy. So mood changes, oftentimes women can seek uh, counseling and professional support. They can use non-hormonal therapies such as uh, antidepressants. For hot flashes, we often advise women to avoid triggers, so that's like hot food, spicy food, alcohol, dress in layers, maintain a healthy weight, and get a lot of sleep. And then for the vaginal dryness, there can be lubricants for short-term relief and moisturizers without estrogen that can be longer-term relief. And again, these conversations should be happening with the patient's primary care doctor, their gynecologist, um, to really get a sense of what is going to work for women. And sometimes it's a multi-pronged uh, approach. So the other thing um, in terms of thinking about women and blood clots, we talked about this patient uh, who, who had a PE. There's also, it's really important to know your risks and talk a little bit about this. And just to uh, go over this again, it's important to know what your risks are. Pregnancy, childbirth, hormonal therapies, if you're hospitalized or having surgery, if you have cancer and some cancer therapies, if you've had any kind of injury, personal or family history, immobility, and obesity. So those are main risk factors for getting a blood clot. And women should really work with their healthcare providers to identify if they actually have any of those risk factors. And if they do, take some steps to reduce their risk of actually getting a blood clot. On top of prevention, it's also really important to recognize the signs and symptoms of both a deep vein thrombosis and a pulmonary embolism. So the signs of a deep vein thrombosis can be unilateral swelling, if it's one leg, sometimes it can be both legs, redness, warmth, and pain, and it can even be pain to touch. The signs and symptoms of a blood clot in the lung, so that would be breaking off and going to the lung, can be difficulty breathing, coughing up blood, a faster than normal or irregular heartbeat, or chest pain, and oftentimes the chest pain is worse when take, people take a deep breath. And people should really seek medical attention if they have any of the signs that I just mentioned, either a blood clot in the leg. And if you can't breathe, probably important to seek medical attention immediately and sometimes even calling 911. So it's important to recognize the signs of a blood clot. The problem with some of these, especially the ones in the lungs, is PEs are also considered the great masquerader. Because if you have pneumonia, you might cough up a little bit of blood or you might have difficulty breathing. If you have asthma, you might have difficulty breathing. So sometimes it's very hard to tease out, but I would advise patients not to try to figure out this out on their own, and if they have these symptoms, to actually seek medical care. So going back to our patient, our 20-year-old college junior, diagnosed with a PE, she had the signs initially of a DVT. She had pain, it was difficult to walk, she had not been working out, and she was ignored. Now unfortunately, this is not just seen with pulmonary emboli. There was a study of over 180,000 patients who presented to, with a heart attack. And they found in that study that women were more likely to die after a heart attack due to unequal treatments, up to three times more likely, in fact. They were less likely to report chest pain and more likely to dismiss their symptoms. And from the very first point of contact with the healthcare professionals in this study, women were less likely to receive the diagnostic tests, and it led to them being 
50% more likely to be initially misdiagnosed. Women were 34% less likely to receive procedures that would unblock their arteries. But when this, the researchers looked at the women who did receive all the recommended treatments, that gap in mortality between the sexes decreased dramatically. So I think this speaks to the need for ongoing public awareness campaigns to really address women's recognition of symptoms and early action, not just for heart attacks, but also for PE. So going back to our patient, our 20-year-old college junior, just diagnosed with a PE, what are her options for treating her pulmonary emboli? Fortunately, she was hemodynamically stable, meaning her blood pressure was okay. She was not requiring much oxygen. So we could get away with just treating her with anticoagulation. There are several different options, the heparins, the lomagrit heparins, warfarin, which is an oral drug, and then a bunch of the direct oral anticoagulants. You've probably heard these. Apixaban, which is also called Eliquis, Rivaroxaban is Zalto, Dibigatran is Pradaxa, and Edoxaban is Cervesa. Now the question is, which one should we choose for our patient? That depends on four different things. Patient preferences, some of these drugs are once a day, some of them are twice a day, some need to be taken with food. Patient characteristics, patients who have liver issues or renal issues or are on other medications that might interact. Anticoagulation properties, and oftentimes when I am working with the patient and we're deciding which anticoagulant is best for them, it all boils down to what their insurance will cover. So the next question is, how should we manage our patient if she develops heavy menstrual bleeding while on anticoagulation? Well, there's a talk later on where you're going to hear about um, heavy bleeding and um, how to uh, diagnose and treat adolescents with heavy bleeding. These are heavy menstrual bleeding while on anticoagulation. It's a little bit different. And this is very important. This was a study that um, I did with the Viette Registry where we looked at over 40,000 men and women and we found what their bleeding risk was uh, what, uh, during anticoagulation and what their current risk of DBT and PE were. And you can see here that women have the highest rate of major bleeding. And so this is not an insignificant issue when we're treating patients with anticoagulants, especially women. So this is a great article on how I treat heavy menstrual bleeding associated with anticoagulants. And the first thing you want to do is rule out any alternative causes. I generally tell my patients you should expect your bleeding to increase about 10 or 15% of what it normally is without anticoagulants. And if it's much more than that, you actually want to make sure they don't have something anatomical, like a fibroid or something else going on. Oftentimes, you can try a different direct oral anticoagulant or reduce the direct oral anticoagulant if they're on one of those. And then there's a drug called tranexamic acid, which is what's called an antifibrinolytic. And that works by slowly uh, breaking down, oops, oh, something happened here. Oops, sorry about that. Um, that works a lot by slowly breaking, uh, slowing the breakdown of the blood clot, um, and that will help prevent prolonged bleeding. So that's another option. So the next question is, how long should our patient be treated with anticoagulation? Um, well, this could be a whole talk in and of itself, uh, way more than the 15 minutes. In general, um, when patients have a uh, risk factor for causing a blood clot uh, that is transient or reversible, and you've taken away that risk factor, in general, we treat for three months. But in patients that have ongoing risk factors or you were able to identify the risk factors, it's often longer than that. For our patients, she had, our patient, she had just been started on oral contraceptives two months before, and so she will be treated with three months of anticoagulation. So my closing reflections are women have a unique clotting challenge at various times in their lives. We've talked about pregnancy, birth control, and menopause. It's really important for women to know what their risks are and discuss them with a provider. And often not just one provider, the primary care doctor can get involved. If they've had blood clots, obviously they have a hematologist or a vascular uh, person that's helping them. And then their OBGYN, very important to have kind of a multidisciplinary approach to talking to patients about this. It's very important for women to know the signs of blood clots and seek medical attention. And not to stop if they're not heard that first time, like my patient. You know, she was told that she had a pulled muscle, and thank goodness she didn't stop there, and when she developed other symptoms, sought medical care. And then lastly, public awareness campaigns are definitely needed to raise awareness, um, and so that women um, and uh, are, are um, 
uh, when they present with signs and symptoms of problems uh, that they're treated appropriately. So resources for healthcare professionals, there's the National Blood Clot Alliance, and here is their website. Uh, I encourage you to go. They have wonderful programs about clots, patient stories, uh, things for healthcare professionals, how to get involved, a lot of really wonderful information uh, that both patients and providers can go to. There's also the Pulmonary Embolus Response Team Consortium. There's the Anticoagulation Forum, and there's the North American Thrombosis Forum. On top of that, I've lifted some articles that the American Society of Hematology uh, has provided. Um, and so there's some good guidelines for the treatment and prevention of obstetric-associated venous uh, blood clots, um, as well as management of VTE, especially in these situations. And then for patients in the public, again, I would go to Stop the Clot. That's the National Blood Clot Alliance. There's a spectrum of resources and educational contact about blood clots. Womeninbloodclots.org and StopTheClot.org with peer support. They have a wonderful peer support group for any patients that are looking for that. So again, it's a real honor to, um, to be on this panel and to give this talk and to help raise awareness. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosowski. That was really informative. And I already am making some connections in my head from my maternal and child health background. Some of the, the key themes I think are going to come up again and again as we go throughout these conversations. Um, so thank you so much for that. Up next, we have fertility and pregnancy and thalassemia advances and challenges. Um, and we're really excited to have Sylvia Singer. Um, MD, Professor of Pediatrics in um, Hematology and Oncology at UCSF Benahoff Children's Hospital in Oakland, California. Um, so thank you so much. I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much. It's really exciting to be talking in this forum about uh, women and girls uh, bleeding disorders. Um, it's my first time in this forum. Um, and um, as the title says, I want to talk a little bit about uh, these issues which are uh, very relevant nowadays to many uh, thalassemia women. Um, so as a brief introduction, thalassemia is a genetic hemoglobin disorder. It causes reduced or absent hemoglobin synthesis. And generally, it's categorized into two main groups based on the clinical presentation. The first group in green is the non-transfusion dependent thalassemia. They can have various genetic mutations, but generally they're not transfusion dependent for survival, except maybe later in their life. The second group has more severe genetic mutations in purple here, and they are named transfusion dependent thalassemia or beta zero thalassemia major or Cooley's anemia, various previous names. And the transfusion-dependent thalassemia patients um, get regular transfusions typically since infancy. Anywhere between two and four weeks, they come to the hospital and get blood transfusions. Uh, the transfusions improve their anemia. It corrects um, their hemolysis. It decreases the bone expansion and the bony malformations and overall improves quality of life, growth, and development. However, there is one major side effect. There are others as well, but the major side effect is iron overload. As the packed red blood cells have quite a lot of iron in them, and there is no physiological mechanism to get rid of this excess iron. Therefore, part of the regular transfusion treatment is iron chelation treatment. It goes hand by hand with transfusion treatment. Otherwise, it can become fatal and cause other severe organ dysfunctions. Um, and just to give a general um, kind of a global perspective of how common thalassemia is, it's very common globally. It goes along the malaria belt, as you can see on the map here, uh, very common in the Southeast Asia, Asia, um, and Mid Middle East area. In the United States, there are about 2,000 cases of severe, uh, typically transfusion-dependent thalassemia patients, more with immigration patterns, and quite a lot more of less of non-transfusion-dependent thalassemia. So what can we say about thalassemia women? Um, Historically, pregnancy what was not a viable option for thalassemia uh, women. They knew that they have iron overload, they had heart disease, they had short survival rates, they could not sustain a pregnancy without having huge, um, typically cardiac issues, and it was 
quite forbidden by their providers. However, that has gradually changed first in Europe, Italy, Greece, where the disease is common and pregnancy and fertility are very important culturally and eventually also in the United States and other countries. Currently, thalassemia women, and I'm in this talk really referring only to the transfusion dependent thalassemia, uh, these women also desire to have a family and give birth. However, they are still facing quite a lot of problems, mostly because of lack of information. They don't know typically what's their fertility potential. Can they get pregnant? Do they need help? They don't know what their op options are to potentially preserve the reproductive capacity, especially if they don't have a partner and they want to think about it for the future. Um, they also are not sure frequently who to discuss it with. Should it be their primary physician? Should it be the hematologist? Uh, they are reluctant. They have fears about sustaining a pregnancy, becoming pregnant, as well as not surviving long enough as survival rates are still less than the normal population for thalassemia patients, whether or not ethically they should have a child if they may not survive beyond, let's say, 50 or 60 years old. That is a changing target these days, but still a concern for many women. So overall, all this insufficient information causes delays in obtaining treatment. Um, I have a quote here from a patient that finally in her mid-30s had a life partner and she says, I'm too old now, it's too late for me to have a child, I'm told, and obviously very frustrated and disappointed. So lack of information and better handling by the providers is still an issue. So what is really the problem? Um, as I mentioned, um, women uh, get transfusion regularly and they frequently develop either primary or secondary amenorrhea or, eventually, or irregular menstrual cycles. They often have difficulty conceiving spontaneously and generally most that wanna have a child, depends on the age, but most require ovulation induction treatment or other uh, reproductive technology methods in order to get pregnant. Their pregnancy by definition is typically by the OBGYNs uh, considered to be a high risk pregnancies because of their other cardiac, hepatic and endocrine disorders, as well as bony deformities, low structure sometimes. So these are the topics I wanted to briefly cover in the next 10-15 uh, minutes. Uh, the iron overload and how it affects fertility, how do we assess it nowadays, um, and um, how do we try to preserve fertility, as well as a little bit about preparing a woman for pregnancy and monitoring through pregnancy. Um, so iron overload, as mentioned, um, is a huge problem in thalassemia care. Iron tends to accumulate mostly in the liver, however, also in the heart, which is still the most common cause of death in thalassemia as well as in the endocrine glands, a pancreas, diabetes is quite common, a thyroid, and obviously pituitary gland, ovaries and testes, which is what's relevant to our discussion today. And the pituitary gland is a very sensitive organ, it turns out, to iron deposition and injury. Iron causes the pituitary cells to shrink and damage, and over time there is a reduced secretion and synthesis of LH and FSH, our hormone that stimulates ovaries or testes, therefore also eventually having low estrogen, low testosterone, which are typically replaced in these transfusion-dependent thalassemia patients. There is also probably an additional direct effect of iron as part of the oxidative injury that iron causes to the ovaries and the testes. However, that's somewhat controversial. It's probably happening more in men than in women, and it's more in severe iron overload. Um, so that iron that deposits in the pituitary is the most common endocrinopathy in transfusion-dependent thalassemia. It's considered to be anywhere between 25 to 55 percent of adult thalassemia patients. Even with the most recent, in the recent 10-15 years, newer iron chelation treatments that are given orally nowadays, it's still a common endocrinopathy. Um, and obviously depends on the severity and the 
progression over the years, it eventually could result in partial or complete infertility. Here is an illustration um, of a T2 weighted MRI looking at the left on a normal pituitary gland where you can see it white with very clear uh, borders. However, in a patient with a severe iron overload, it's black, which is iron, as well as destruction of some of the pituitary gland. And that's an important uh, part of our management of thalassemia. The iron over time doesn't only reduce the hormone synthesis, but it really causes the gland to shrink. And we can, in MRI methodology, measure the volume and see that it gets low over time. Um, on the figure here, you can see that as the volume gets lower, this is a measure of the variation of the volume of the pituitary compared to normal uh, population. When the volume decreases, the LH secretion on this um, case also goes down. Um, so how do we assess in women with uh, transfusion-dependent iron overload their reproductive potential? LH, FSH, as mentioned, can decrease over time as the pituitary gets more iron loaded and is not a great assessment for the reproductive potential. What about their ovarian function? So there are many methods to check ORT, which is the ovarian reserve testing. Um, I'm mentioning two here that have been uh, looked more in thalassemia. One is the AFC, the antral follicle count. Uh, through a transvaginal ultrasound, the, uh, the OB or GYN can measure and count the antral follicles, the developing eggs. Additionally, there is a hormone, anti-malarian hormone, that's secreted by the ovarian granulosa cells. It is a simple blood test, and it was found in many studies to correlate very well with the AFC, with the count of the follicles. And the good thing is that AMH is not cycle dependent and it's not dependent on the LH, FSH. So they can be low and it's not going to affect AMH secretion, which is a big advantage in thalassemia. Um, generally, AFC and AMH, they indicate the remaining number of follicles in the ovary. They physiologically decline with age up to a level of menopause when they're extremely low or not detectable. Um, and in the fertility world, low AFC and AMH basically means lower chance for successful ovulation induction, and it's used a lot in various uh, IVF and fertility clinics. Here is just an example where you can see the clear follicles counted in a normal case, while there it's very low in the other case. So it's a visualized uh, measure. And uh, here are um, some measures of what we found in our studies, and this was um, since found in other studies as well, where we tried to find the AFC in thalassemia women um, here in, the green, in red triangles or squares, as opposed to the normal population. You can see on the left, the, uh, the antral follicle count is overall lower in thalassemia, but it's still there. Normal follicle count will be over 12 or 12 to 25 in the general population, obviously declining with age as menopause uh, gets closer. Um, and in the thalassemia women, the AFC has been overall somewhat lower, especially in, in their 30s. Same thing with AMH. We can see that they have their hormone. However, it's lower than the general population. And the it seems to decline prematurely towards menopause in the mid or late uh, 30s. In two thirds of the women, we found that um, AFC was less than eight, while good fertility potential is over 12, but it's still not a bad number. So gen in summary, in, in terms of the ovarian reserve in thalassemia, ovarian follicles are often low, but they are present, which is good. It's probably low due to lack of LH FSH stimulation, maybe some direct effect on the ovaries by the iron. Um, however, most thalassemia women have preserved ovarian function, which is great. Um, therefore, the assumption is that hormonal stimulation is expected to be successful and 
help with their becoming pregnant. Uh, however, we have to keep in mind that there is an earlier decline in follicle count and in the AMH in the mid and late 30s, and any fertility planning should take that in consideration. So how do we prevent that decline from the hematology perspective? Uh, again, the iron is the main cause of that. So maintaining a consistent low iron levels, chelation from an early age is key. Women that have been doing that, they typically a lot of pressure of family to chelate, um, have had less problems than others that during teenage years or later chelate only 50% of the time or so when there is a surge in their iron level. Um, also, when we see some changes, more intense oral iron chelation, combining several chelators can help and has been shown in several studies to lessen the hypogonadism and in some rare cases even reverse some of the malfunction. Additionally, uh, vitamin C and E and antioxidants can somewhat reduce iron toxicity that has been shown in the fertility studies more in males than in females, but probably still effective in females as well. It's important to monitor regularly the change in hormones and see if there is a decline and catch it early. Um, and inquire early, but whether it comes from the patient or the provider about ORT, ovarian reserve testing, fertility intervention, and any methods like egg freezing to preserve fertility. Additionally, from the hematologic point of view, I just want to mention we don't do typically pituitary MRIs on a regular basis. However, we do do T to star MRIs annually to check how much iron there is in the heart. And there is a very good correlation as seen in the figure here between the cardiac and the pituitary iron. So one can predict and identify risk thresholds for changing fertility based on how much uh, iron there is in the heart. And again, intervene with intensify or modify the chelation patterns. So if a woman with all that wants to prepare for pregnancy and the, what do we offer her? Again, it's a practical option um, with ovulation induction. There were over 400 or 450 pregnancies reported. There are probably more that have not been documented. Um, and a, about two thirds occurred in women that had no menses and had needed a gonadotropin induction in order to ovulate and uh, become pregnant. So pre-pregnancy, it's very important to have a multidisciplinary team uh, that deals with all the potential problems and prepare the woman to be in an optimal health for carrying a fetus. Uh, there are some guidelines that we follow if there are markers of a high iron in the liver and more so even in the heart, we try to delay conception, intensify chelation as much as possible. Some women feel that they are already getting older and it's an issue, but that's our attempt. Um, hepatitis C positivity has been a huge problem for the thalassemia population, less so now, but we treat that first and educate about that. Um, very important to get assessment of the cardiac function um, before pregnancy and several echoes during pregnancy, as well as endocrine screening for all the hormones that are commonly affected by the iron overload. And psychological issues, um, again, can be very significant for a couple and for the woman with fears and the other issues that have to be addressed prior to the pregnancy. Um, so what have the reports in the recent 10-15 uh, years shown us about uh, pregnancies in the transfusion-dependent thalassemia? So again, about two-thirds, 70% required fertility treatment in order to get pregnant. The mean age in the reports of pregnancies is relatively young, 24 to 30 years old. Um, all of them to keep a good fetal growth and health required more blood during pregnancy than before, about 20% more, and their hemoglobin during pregnancy was kept at a mean of 11. Pre-transfusion hemoglobin is usually not less than 10 or 10.5 as a guideline. Because of more transfusion and less chelation, there is increase in iron overload, so there was increase in ferritin. There was also a 
quite significant increase in liver iron, which is the main organ that, uh, that stores iron in our body. So pretty much tripled in one of the large studies in Italy. There is a mild increase in cardiac iron, which is good. Iron in the heart accumulates in a slower pace than in the liver. Uh, many women required anticoagulation during pregnancy, especially in, the, in the splenexomized women, which is a treatment modality in the past to um, decrease transfusion requirement. Um, and the good thing, there were no reports of thrombotic events in these splenectomized women. Um, those that had high glucose prior to pregnancy, again, because the pancreas is another organ that's affected by iron overload, had the gestation, gestational diabetes. And the chelation issue, the iron chelation issues, most women do not want to use iron chelation and there is no proof that the oral chelators are indeed safe for the fetus. So they are not getting any iron chelation during the first two trimesters. Most are encouraged to take desferal, which is given subcutaneously during their third trimester. Therefore, there is an expected increase in iron load um, and coupled with the higher cardiac effort during pregnancy, there is obviously an increased risk for cardiac issues, arrhythmias, and there is a need for cardiology and monitoring through pregnancy. What happens, uh, what are the outcomes of this pregnancy that we know? So 90% resulted in successful delivery. Uh, there is a high incidence of twins because there is probably a lot of um, hormonal stimulation given ahead of time. 7% um, had miscarriages. Um, usually their cesarean section is recommended for these women. Many of them have a short truncal size and for other um, OB reasons, that's the modality of delivery in most cases. A prematurity or mild prematurity is pretty common, 30 to 36 gestational weeks. Low birth weight was not very high, and overall, no increased rate of birth defects. So these are all very good outcomes overall. So in summary, uh, what we know nowadays is understand better of the risk thresholds for infertility. We know better to monitor the iron level, the hormones, and when to intervene. Uh, we have better markers that can predict fertility status, and it's validated in TDT women, those AFC, AMH, and other modalities to assess uh, ovarian reserve. Uh, we've also established guidelines for pre and during pregnancy monitoring. There is a very detailed guideline in, in, through the Thalassemia International Federation, as well as Coolies Anemia. And there are hundreds of successful pregnancies that have been reported. So it has become a more common occurrence. However, there are some remaining challenges. Uh, we don't always screen early enough, therefore we don't intervene early enough. Um, the access to reproductive technology and fertility preservation um, is not really available by insurance companies for thalassemia women. Um, there are some states, as a comparison, that do cover that service for young women that went through chemotherapy uh, for an oncological case. Uh, however, it's not the case for thalassemia. Um, women that are in their mid-30s have more complex thalassemia and other issues, so fertility becomes more complicated, higher pregnancy risks. And again, these women sometimes need to be addressed and intervened earlier. And there is a need for more studies, especially longitudinal studies, to understand more the kind of chelation, what agents should we use to really intensify and allow preservation of fertility. So a lot has happened, but more to do. And with that, I want to thank everybody. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Singer. That was really informative. And I will say I'm, I'm continuing to connect my own dots here from bleeding disorders to other blood disorders, hearing a lot around, you know, that, that piece around collaborating care between different types of expert providers and how core that is and important that is for women, be it, you know, your hematologist in an OBGYN or your hematologist in whatever other kind of treatment that you're, you're needing and whatever kind of care. That's a, a huge thing. So um, thank you for all of those insights and we will move on to our next speaker.
So next up, we have uh, Dr. Christina Haley, DOMCR, Associate Professor, Pediatric Hematology and Oncology um, at Dornbecker Children's Hospital, Oregon Health and Science University, talking to us about heavy menstrual bleeding in adolescents, lessons learned from a multidisciplinary clinic. So I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm excited to be here to talk about our clinic here at Oregon Health and Science University um, and about heavy menstrual bleeding in adolescents. Um, I have received grant funding from the American Thrombosis and Hemostasis Network. So just some objectives today. We're going to talk about um, what is heavy menstrual bleeding and that it can be a sign of an underlying bleeding disorder. Um, describe the impact of heavy menstrual bleeding in adolescents. Uh, describe at least one format of a multidisciplinary approach to adolescents with heavy menstrual bleeding and explain how this approach can streamline and improve care. So just to start with a couple of definitions, um, adolescence, as we all may recall, is the period of transition from childhood to adulthood um, that comes with all sorts of exciting learning opportunities. Um, and then as the WHO defines as ages 10 to 19. The other definition to remember is what is a normal period. Um, and for normal menstrual cycles in young females, the median age at when they first start is 12 and a half years. And typically, um, girls get one period a month. Um, and the normal duration of a period should be less than or equal to seven days. And then even the definition of how, much, how many products are used um, over the course of a day during the period um, is defined as three to six um, pads or tampons per day. So then in contrary to that, heavy menstrual bleeding is defined um, as any of the following. Um, bleeding that lasts more than seven days, bleeding that soaks through one or more tampons or pads every hour for several hours in a row, needing to wear more than one pad at a time to control menstrual flow, needing to change pads or tampons during the night, or menstrual flow with blood clots that are as big as a quarter or larger. So just looking at some epidemiology, about 30% of women of reproductive age have heavy menstrual bleeding, and around 5% of women of that age group see their primary care provider for heavy menstrual bleeding annually. This is a pretty big group of people. I'm just looking at the U.S. population from 2016, which is, um, this is from the March of Dimes um, website. Um, the population of women ages 15 to 44 in 2016 was over 63 million. So if we put 5% of 63 million, that means 3.1 million women seek care for heavy menstrual bleeding each year. Um, and that seems like a lot. So then if we move on to what's the prevalence of bleeding disorders in women with heavy menstrual bleeding, the term menorrhagia is used in this table, but it has now been replaced um, with the term heavy menstrual bleeding. Um, so we see here like a pretty wide range of prevalence or um, uh, how many people with heavy menstrual bleeding have these types of bleeding disorders. Um, but it can be anywhere from 5 to 20% for von Willebrand's disease or 1 to 47% for platelet disorders, which can be um, really wide ranging based on how those are diagnosed. And then um, for factor 11 or, or hemophilia, a lower percentage. So if you kind of do some math, you can say that let's say 20% of women have, um, with heavy menstrual bleeding have an underlying bleeding disorder based on this prevalence data. Based on the math from the previous slide, we could say that approximately 636,000 of the 3.1 million who present annually with heavy menstrual bleeding may have an underlying bleeding disorder. Um, I had the opportunity to look at the data in the ASIN data set, the American Thrombosis and Hemostasis Network data set of women that are cared for at hemophilia centers across the United States. And there were just um, just under 9,000 women in that data set cared for at hemophilia treatment centers. So um, this suggests that maybe we're missing some of these women. If we look specifically at adolescent here in Table 3, um, we can see that the prevalence of bleeding disorders in adolescents with heavy menstrual bleeding is even more widely ranged than in adult women. And part of this is that um, that um, people haven't always looked for bleeding disorders in adolescents presenting with heavy menstrual bleeding. And again, 
um, especially for platelet dysfunction, the diagnosis and evaluation can be really variable. But the numbers are really, really wide ranging from 2 to 44% for platelet dysfunction. And then on the opposite kind of end of this, we look in table one here at the prevalence of heavy menstrual bleeding in women with bleeding disorders and can see that it is a really common symptom in patients with all sorts of bleeding disorders, whether that's von Willebrand's disease or platelet disorders or factor deficiency. And so heavy menstrual bleeding really stands out as a common symptom for bleeding disorders in women. And I think from this epidemiology, my summary or my takeaway is we don't actually know how many adolescents with heavy menstrual bleeding have an underlying bleeding disorder, but probably more than we currently see, and we, we need to do better. I think it's also important to think about the impact of all this bleeding on our patients. Um, and part of this can be delayed diagnosis. Um, and not realizing that you have a bleeding disorder until you're an older adult and then maybe not getting the appropriate treatment. Iron deficiency is really common due to the excessive bleeding and up to 50% of adolescents with heavy menstrual bleeding are iron deficient. And that uh, iron deficiency can be associated with in, um, fatigue, decreased endurance, impaired school performance and mood disorders. They see lots of girls um, present uh, with their heavy menstrual bleeding and severe anemia and require red blood cell transfusions. There's significant um, impact on quality of life. Up to 50% of young women in some studies have um, reported missed school or missed after school activities due to their heavy bleeding. There's been reports of bullying. And then emergent interventions that happen because um, there wasn't enough um, kind of anticipation of heavy bleeding in these patients. So when we think about the evaluation and treatment of heavy menstrual bleeding in teenagers, there's kind of um, a combination of things to think about. So there's the part of um, the hormones and how your brain, uh, your pituitary, your thyroid, your adrenal glands, and your ovaries all have to communicate with one another to have a normal menstrual cycle. Um, and that there's a lot of crosstalk back and forth that has to get organized once you start having periods and then over the lifetime of your periods. Um, and so the, the, there's this kind of thinking about things and how um, the hormones impact your periods. And then as a hematologist, this is a, a, my cartoon of how the blood clot system works um, and thinking about both platelets and clotting factors and von Willebrand's disease or von Willebrand factor and how deficiencies or dysfunction of any of these could play into heavy bleeding. So there's really an important moment where it's nice to have a shared approach, where you have somebody that's thinking of these um, either structural or hormonal causes of heavy menstrual bleeding, which might be a primary care provider, depending upon their comfort level, a gynecologist or an adolescent medicine provider, and then a hematologist who's thinking about the different things that can affect how blood clots effectively. So, when I first started um, here at OHSU, um, I was offered the opportunity to start a combined clinic with a gynecologist to address um, young women with heavy menstrual bleeding or with bleeding disorders because of this kind of shared idea that there's both the hormonal component or structural component and uh, potentially um, clotting um, uh, problems. And so our clinic is named the Spots, Dots, and Clots Clinic. Um, it was named that by, we had a naming contest, so one of our, our, our trainees named it that. Um, and we have a gynecologist in our clinic who has an adolescent medicine and um, family planning, which is a um, complex contraception um, training focus. And then I'm the pediatric hematologist in our clinic. We're physically located in the Center for Women's Health, which we specifically chose um, as it is um, kind of a nice way to help young women transition to adult care and then also has all the um, necessary equipment for the gynecologist if she needs to do procedures. And then we have hemophilia center support as needed. Other services we offer are iron infusions, sedation for procedures like intrauterine device insertions, and we see patients both new and return as long as they're less than 20. If they're older than that, they get to see the adult hematologist. So our clinic is set up kind of like this. So a primary care doctor might see their patient and say, hey, you have really heavy periods, um, or you're really iron deficient, and maybe it could be related to your periods. They refer them to either hematology or gynecology, and we route them to our clinic and see them there. And how we have it set up is um, that the patient arrives, they fill out an intake form, they're seen by the gynecologist, and then I arrive late because I always have a meeting that starts in the morning, so there I am going down the stairs. The second patient arrives. 
their room to start their intake form. And then the gynecologist comes out from seeing the first patient, and I'm there, and we talk about the first patient. She tells me her intake uh, input, and I um, talk to her about what I've been thinking if I've read the chart, and we talk about what we're thinking about the second patient. And then I go see the first patient. She goes to see the second patient. We reemerge from our rooms and discuss our plans, and then I go to see the second patient. The first patient goes off to get their labs or carry out their plans, while the gynecologist goes to see the third patient. The other one goes to lab. And at the end, we do this uh, kind of a huddle to, to discuss our follow-up plans and confirm what we're going to do next and discuss any outstanding issues from prior clinics and make our plans for our next clinic. So our approach to heavy menstrual bleeding um, has really evolved a bit over our time of over our time in our clinic, um, and we really focus on what's our desired effect. Do we want to promote regularity of the period? Do we want to decrease bleeding? Does the patient also need contraception? What does the patient want? What are they willing to do? Um, can they swallow pills? Um, do they uh, want to? procedure, what's, what else is going on, and then what's the urgency? So um, have they required a recent blood transfusion? Um, are they missing school? What else is going on that may require us to do something faster? And then once we've decided on our treatment, we um, sometimes it takes a while for that to have maximum effect. And so in the meantime, we aggressively treat iron deficiency. We really work to provide like bathroom passes or whatever we can do to get this patient to school as much as possible and then ensure that they have our contact information for follow-up. And sometimes in that in-between time, we'll consider an addition um, or adding tranexamic acid to help with bleeding. This is just a list of the various hormones that we'll use, and this tends to be our kind of go-to for control of heavy menstrual bleeding, that um, various hormones work very well. Um, we also will use tranexamic acid, like I said, and this has been um, demonstrated in a few different studies to be more effective than DDAVP. Um, we usually don't use factor replacements in our patients because usually the hormones work so effectively that we don't have to go to factor replacements. So that's an example of our clinic. Um, there's actually a bunch of clinics across the country um, that when we started, like now I think it's six years ago, we were one of, oh gosh, under 10 clinics when we started. Um, and now there's all of these cl clinics across the country. And so there's been really a great um, call to action to see how we can provide comprehensive care to, to women with bleeding disorders, which I think is a really great um, thing for these patients. Um, and that part of this effort has been through the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders, who supported the growth of these clinics and the kind of inter-clinic uh, collaboration. So just as an example, quickly, um, there's a bunch of different ways you can have these clinics. So it might be that you have a heme and gynecologist provider it's at the hemophilia center. You only see patients with known bleeding disorder diagnoses. Or maybe it's an adolescent medicine doctor and a hematologist, and you only see new patients for evaluation or workup. Or maybe it's a nurse practitioner from hematology and a gynecologist, and you've decided we're not seeing thrombosis patients. We have to work at the satellite clinic. This is what's going on. There's a lot of different ways to do this, and it depends a lot on what your institution has to support um, and what other um, people are interested in working on this. So just some lessons that I've learned through this course. Um, I think having a network is really critical. Um, so we've been really fortunate to have um, really great support here at our institution and allow us to work with adolescent medicine or through the hemophilia center to get these patients the care they need. And then working with the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders and the Learning Action Network through there has allowed us to do some really great research um, to help improve care for these patients. And then we've collaborated here with our, um, our ch local chapter to do some, um, some additional education and then working closely with schools to make sure we can address how do we get these patients um, back to school since so many of them miss school. And then the other big takeaway I've had um, is that it's rarely just one thing. So sometimes it's that somebody has a mild bleeding disorder and they have hormonal imbalance. And so maybe they wouldn't have so many symptoms if they didn't, if they just had one of those things. Or maybe they have iron deficiency anemia, plus they have something at school that's making it hard for them to learn, and those two things make it even worse. Um, or they have really painful cramps and they need contraception. And so there's a lot of thinking about how do, how do we bring these together and, um, and target both of them. 
And then finally, our approach has been to have a shared decision-making model. So thinking about with the patient, what makes sense? What are the goals of care? What will inhibit success? And then two, shared decision between heme and gyne. So for example, if somebody needs an intrauterine device um, inserted, often gynecology will you put them on uh, ibuprofen beforehand for controlling cramps. And then I'll say, wait, we can't do that because they have von Willebrand's disease. And so we just have that uh, crosstalk, which is really important. And then I think my biggest lesson learned is that a combined hematology, gynecology, or adolescent medicine medicine clinic is a really great way to get patients the care they need. And now there's many people across the country that can help um, other clinics get started. And through the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders, we've set up kind of a mentorship program for um, clinics that are interested in getting started to work with another clinic to pass on kind of their lessons learned. So with that, I just wanted to thank everybody again for giving me this opportunity to talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Haley. That was really, you know, I think from a public health perspective, both looking at the data to identify the gaps and then looking at actual broader systems and structures that how can we address this maybe locally, but maybe share those learnings so that across the country, can we all work together to start to close some of those gaps? And, um, you know, teens and adolescents are definitely a passion of mine as well. So I think, you know, when we've been looking at a lot of this work, it's like, how do we catch all these things as early as possible to have the greatest impact? So thank you for sharing your work in this arena. Um, and for all of our speakers so far, really having that, you know, hematology and provider perspective, I'm really excited to transition into some of our next speakers that are also going to bring in the patient advocacy voice as well. So our next speaker is John Velasco, who is our manager of education and training here at the National Hemophilia Foundation. And he is going to be sharing more with us about our Better You Know campaign, BYK, um, all about really you know, reaching those who are undiagnosed. So John, I'll hand it off to you. Great, thank you so very much. It is such a pleasure to be here with an incredible uh, knowledge that we're, we're learning. And you know, I'm, I've been taking notes uh, for the past hour or so. Uh, so it's really great just to get a refresher. Uh, so thank you all for being part of this. Um, and thank you, Kate. And as you know, uh, my name is John Velasco. I am one of the managers of education and training here at NHF. And, you know, I am here to talk a little bit about our Better You Know campaign, and more importantly, how this Better You Know campaign, how it can be of use of you and to your community and to your folks um, and to your institution. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that and then at the end show you how you can actually be part of that energy and be part of that force that's going to move us forward. You know, I have no disclosures. I, I work at NHS. Uh, so Better You Know, you know, what is this Better You Know? This Better You Know program, today we're going to have an opportunity to look a little bit about uh, its history, to look at the different components of the Better You Know program, the evolution of it, but more importantly, talking about the, uh, the tools that are readily available to anyone 24-7 days on our, um, on our website. So we're going to be taking a look at uh, our Better You Know Advocates, our education materials, and our assessment tool, and some of our webinars. So a little bit about the Better You Know history. You know, it, this started about around 2014 with the CDC Cooperative Agreement. That actually is ending in September, um, but it has given us a great opportunity to really create a program that has been researched, that has been well thought out with theory, and more importantly, it has that opportunity to really empower folks, not just community members, but also providers. In 2015, we actually did a needs assessment. We actually, that information really helped us to build what were some of the lack, what was lacking within the educational, um, per, you know, what we were providing educationally, and also what were some of the things that the consumers felt that they actually needed. In addition to understanding, you know, what were some of the avenues that some of the providers actually were missing out on. So that, all that information really helped us build this campaign. And in 2016, a website was launched, and this website included videos, postcards, and also paid media. This, uh, this website is the betteryouknow.org, which you'll be hearing me talk about throughout the whole, uh, throughout my whole session, uh, which you're going to have engraved in your brain, uh, by the end. In 2017, we actually then created some partnerships. And these partnerships are really important for us because we know that here at NHF, you know, we have an incredible community that we've been working with, HTCs and providers. But we also wanted to see what could we do? How could we start 
bringing this message and bringing this campaign to communities that are not part of NHF. So here we started with two of, of our first types of partnerships. One was Monthly Gift and Thinks. Um, and these were also, we also developed materials that were disseminated um, to folks in addition to start creating some of our educational resources, which I'll be talking a little bit about in a few minutes. Um, and then also the other component that I really enjoy, actually enjoy all of this, this is kind of like my child, and we can't have any favorites, uh, but the provider webinars, uh, which is really great. And actually these webinars are actually on our site, um, so you can actually um, access them at any point. Um, and they will be they, they will be living on our on our website. So this is really good information for some folks as a refresher, and then also for some providers, perhaps some of the first time that they're actually hearing some of this information. So we move over to 2018, um, and 2018 we started building some more um, and started experimenting with some uh, different types of partnerships. Uh, we started doing work with the American College Health Association, A1, and some sororities. We started doing, we did an experiment where we worked with, uh, we gave out chapter mini grants to see how we can empower chapters to create their own programming within their region. See, as a national organization, you know, we go around the country, we provide these great seminars and websites, uh, but the actual, the actual agents of change are folks in the, their regions. So what better people than those folks that working at chapters? Um, and this is actually going to help us springboard when we look at our Better You Know Advocates, which we'll be getting to in, um, in the next couple of points. Um, and then the other component that we are actually found here is that we started realizing that we can't just provide information and resources to our chapters, but also empower them. So we actually did our first training. And our training was done in Michigan, um, at, actually out in St. Louis. And this was a training to empower folks on how to use some of the tools that I'll be talking about in the best way for them, and then also to show them how NHF can actually provide them with better resources as well. The training was so successful that we found out that we actually trained some of our NYLI folks. And some of you know our NYLI folks is a great youth program that empowers our youth with education and training and advocacy so they can actually do work around the country as well. And what better way to look at our longevity by empowering our youth? So we were really excited that we actually provided some um, education and training for, for that specific community as well. And then also looking at how we were able to build this with a very, um, our Von Villebrand Disease Global Call to Action, which is this great, um, great campaign that is happening globally. But what we wanted to do is show how this campaign can work with so many other components that's going on with education and raising awareness. Um, and then in 2019, uh, we started, we finally launched all of our educational materials um, and started doing some little bit more training um, and also did a little bit more paid social media. I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of our educational materials that are, again, are readily available for you on our website in a PDF form. Um, so we'll be talking about that in a few minutes. And then in 2020, here we are. Uh, lots are happen Lots of things are happening this year, but some great things that have been happening this year was that we actually trained volunteers from around the country to become Better You Know advocates. Um, and I'll be talking about these Better You Know advocates, unique group of folks um, that are actually, some of them are bilingual. And the other thing that I want to make sure that you note, that all of our resources, all of our education materials, and the assessment tool is actually in English and in Spanish. But our Better You Know Advocates, also known as BYKA, they, will, uh, they also continue the work. And their focus is working in their region. So like I said earlier, you know, we provide these great resources for people around the country. But what better folks that know their community than the folks that, that we are working with in terms of volunteers to focus um, in their region? So just to let you know a little bit about um, our, our goals here you know, for the Better You Know campaign is, we want more women to get diagnosed for bleeding disorders, right? And we, you know, by listening to Dr. Dr. Haley, we, you know, I really got a true sense, not just the numbers that she was able to give, but also understand that there's so many thousands of folks that are misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed, or then just not even on their radar. So this is that opportunity of taking that of this assessment tool to actually raise their awareness, to talk, to think about whether or not they might be at risk. 
And this is something that Dr. Rosowski talked about in terms of people knowing their risk factors. And we'll be talking a little bit about those risk factors. So we get women to take who we get more women who to get diagnosed for bleeding disorders. Therefore, the good thing about this is that the average length of time between onset symptoms and diagnosis of bleeding disorders is actually reduced. So we're not waiting 15 years. Women are not waiting 20 years. They're not even waiting 10 years. By taking this assessment tool, by, acknowledge, by empowering themselves with education and that possibility that they might be at risk will actually help us move forward. And therefore, women with bleeding disorders can live a healthier, fuller, longer lives with less complications. So a couple of things for you to know in terms of our Better You Know uh, program. These are some numbers that I wanted to share with you all. And these are some numbers that we've actually been sharing for the past couple of months just to really show the benefits of this program. So we've had, we've reached, this Better You Know campaign has reached over 275,000 folks, you know, all around the country and actually all around the, you know, part, different parts of the world. We've reached over 18 countries which is pretty amazing that this information that's out there for folks. In terms of our social media impressions, we've had over 300,000 folks that we've actually been able to connect with in terms of reaching some of those messages. And those messages are to go to our website, to take the assessment tool, and also to learn about some of the educational resources that are available to them. So, you know, I mentioned this Better You Know um, assessment tool, and I'll be talking a little bit about that. But this assessment tool is, uh, is, an, is a great tool that's on our Better You Know website that's both in Spanish and English. And actually, it's also, we have category, two categories for men and women. Um, but we've, we've done, with, through the promotion that we've done, in terms of just the educational programming, the outreach, and then the paid social media, we've reached over, about over 15,000 folks have logged into our Better You Know sessions. But we've had in the past couple of years, about four, the past four years, we've had over 3,000 people complete this assessment tool. Now, that's a great number, right? You know, I, you know, I'm very proud of that number, but I know that we can actually reach more, right? You know, this is just the beginning, and this is where you're going to come into play. You're going to have that opportunity to really be part of that agent of change to help us move forward. But what we found consistently with the folks that are taking this assessment tool about 85% of the folks consistently who take the assessment tool find out that they are at risk for having a bleeding disorder. That's an incredible number, right? You know, going back to what the Dr. Haley was saying, you know, all these missed numbers and all these missed folks. So this is the, the proof that we need to continue raising awareness, empowering folks, specifically women, about their bleeding disorder. And the, the, the proof how this Better You Know uh, campaign actually really works, and the importance of it. So we all know that information is very important. So we've done a couple of, uh, we worked with a couple of uh, organizations to do some surveying for us. And I just want to share a couple of things that we found out. Around one in 10 women that have taken this survey from that, it's a Harris report that we actually did, have heard of the Better You Know, uh, Better you know campaign, right? The betteryouknow.org campaign, which is great. So among women who have heard of the website, a majority of them actually have visited, right? So it's not just like people know about the website. They've actually been onto the website. And some of them also have had some really good positive aspects that when they visited the website in terms of about their symptoms, and they've also shared a couple of their personal stories there. So what we want you to understand is that the longevity of this program is, is incredible. And it's incredible because of the amount of empowerment that it gives folks with education on their own time. And that's one of the things that I love about social media and what I love about the virtual world is that it's done on their own time and in their own privacy. Nobody's watching over them. Nobody's asking them questions. They can visit the site when they need to, get off of it, take the assessment tool, and more importantly, have an opportunity to download some of the educational resources that are there. And what I find also key with all this is that it's an opportunity for them to also share this information, to share this website, and to share this campaign with others. Because that's how we're going to start creating change and empowering other folks. The, sur the survey that we actually had conducted, about two in five have visited the website to learn more about their period and heavy menstrual bleeding. So what we're also finding is that now with this in the virtual world, 
folks are going into different websites to learn about, you know, some of the conditions that, or some of the treatments that they feel that they might need. The Better You Know website is not just approved by the CDC, that we've worked with the CDC and the NHF, but it's based in factual information to empower folks. And I think that is what's missing, that too many times people just go to Google information as opposed to knowing what is that reputable information that's out there for them. So we have found that in terms of the women that have visited to learn about their peers and, um, and their heavy menstrual bleeding, about 40% of them have found some great information about, the, you know, within that, within that component. And then about 18% of these women visited the website to learn about other different types of bleeding disorders. So it works across the board. All right, so our education, our bilingual educational materials. We have eight incredible different types of educational materials that are both for in English and in Spanish. This is one of the major projects out of the campaign. This is a program that was also developed, as I said earlier, with the CDC. So one of the things that we have is a brochure for teen girls, which is actually one of our most really popular brochures. And just to let you all know, when you visit, when you visit the betteryouknow.org, you'll find that in the resources, you'll see all of our education materials in a PDF form. And they're there for you to print, to save, to send to other folks. So we wanted to make sure that it was accessible to folks whenever they needed, and also to share with others. We also have a brochure for general providers on bleeding disorders with women, and then we also have one that's specifically for OBGYNs on bleeding disorders for women as well. So these are two great um, resources that we have for our providers, but what I enjoy about it is that anybody can read these, right? So people can go to their doctors, their providers, with this information and say, you know, I don't really know if you know about this information, or, you know, I think I might be part of this group or part of this community, here's a little bit of information for you. So it actually also empowers our consumers to educate also their providers. And, you know, it's a, it's a give and take. You know, it's a really good relationship. Uh, the other popular uh, material that we have here is our lab test for sure for patients. So, and it's all, we also have a lab test log for our patients. Great information. It's one sheet where people can actually record, you know, their different types of tests to look at you know, what are the tests that they're taking, but also when do they take their tests. So it actually empowers them so they can actually go to the different providers that they're seeing to educate them in terms of you know, what, what, what the tests have been provided with. We also have a doctor visit prep, um, prep preparation uh, guide, which actually really, in, in really good terms, brings comfort of empowerment for folks so they can be ready to talk to their providers. We also have a healthcare diary and some of our postcards that we have readily available that actually are also online that people can actually send through social media or just send to folks you know, as, as a message. Hey, you know, this is something that I've been dealing with. You may want to go to this incredible website to empower yourself a little bit more. Again, all of our educational materials are in Spanish and in English. Again, all on the betteryouknow.org website under our resource uh, tab. And then we have our Better You Know assessment tool. One of the things that, it, what I failed to say earlier today was this Better You Know campaign is the reason why I'm actually, one of the reasons why I'm actually working at NHF. It is a campaign that empowers folks from all different communities, from all different social status and economic status. It's a campaign that gives people that opportunity to learn about themselves, to learn whether they're at risk, and also gives them educational uh, tools to actually work with other folks and to work with their providers. This assessment tool are 10 questions that people take, it's anonymous, and at the end of the assessment tool, you have the opportunity to get an email if you want that tells you about your, your status and then also connects you and helps you connect with different types of platforms that are out there for services, uh, most specifically HTCs in their region really excited about this because it gives that sense of empowerment. And more importantly, we also offer this in Spanish and in English. So when you have an opportunity, please visit the betteryouknow.org uh, website and explore it. You know, there's so many different components of it. We've got videos there, all of our educational resources, and also the assessment tool. And one of the things that I'm also very proud of is this year we initiated the Better You Know Advocates, the BYKA. And here they are. We've got seven advocates that are from, these are volunteers 
from all over the country. We were very lucky that we actually scheduled our training in early February. Uh, so they all traveled to New York City, some of them for the first time. And uh, we have actually one woman who her dream was to work or do some type of work with NHS. So I remember walking with her throughout New York City and how emotional she was because she felt that she you know, finally reached that opportunity for her to actually be trained to empower herself and then to empower other folks so they don't go through the issues that, they, that she went through. And then we also have Chelsea here who's actually in the middle. And she's one of our NYLI folks. So if you remember earlier when I talked about NYLI, it's a youth program that we have um, at NHF. So she graduated from the program last year. She was so focused and so passionate about this work that she decided to apply um, to become a Better You Know Advocate volunteer. Great folks. And two of our seven volunteers are also Spanish-speaking folks. So again, really working to empower the Spanish-speaking communities um, throughout the country. So here are Better You Know Advocates. The training that they went through was a two and a half day training over the weekend in New York City at the NHF headquarters, where we gave them educational materials to show them how they can create change in their region and in their community. Part of this was through educational outreach. So they would create programs, they would create tabling, they would create those opportunities to network and create partnerships in their local communities. Um, and then the second component was through social media. And we had our communications department uh, be part of the training to show them how you actually post something on Instagram and what that actually looks like, or how do you post something on Facebook. And also the importance of telling stories, their own personal stories. All of these people that are part of this program know the importance of education, the importance of empowerment, but also the importance that they didn't want other folks to go through what they went through. You know, as Dr. Haley was talking about, for so many people, for so many women, it takes over 10 years sometimes to actually get properly diagnosed. And having a bleeding disorder sometimes is not even on people's radar. The Better You Know advocates want to work with other folks to raise their awareness so they don't have to go through 10 years of discomfort, 10 years of pain, 10 years not knowing what might be happening into their, in, in their bodies and knowing that there is help, knowing that there is treatment, and knowing that they are not alone. So these are Better You Know advocates. And we're really excited that this program, even though our cooperative agreement ends in September, we've got great plans for the future. And some of those plans are including going into colleges more, creating more of a training program with these advocates here so they can focus and do better um, with other folks. So we want to empower them so they can become trainers to train other advocates. So we've got a lot of, you know, the, the, the opportunity to really expand this program is amazing. But what's more important is you. And what can you do? Well, what can you do, whether you are a provider, whether you work at HTC, whether you're a consumer, is educate yourself. And not just educate yourself, but empower yourself so you can empower others. As Maya Angelou said, do the best you can until you know better. Then, when you know better, do better. And what better way to do that with the Better You Know campaign? We've got the assessment tool. We've got the webinars for providers. We've got educational programming for folks. We do trainings. We also have those educational resources. So what you can do is help create that change. Help with not just those numbers, getting more folks to take the assessment tool. I mean, those numbers are great. But the influence and the opportunity to create change in people's lives, that's what's important. And that's what our world needs right now. Our world needs that sense of hope and that sense of helping others, not for them just to become advocates, but to become well-trained advocates so they can create a difference in the world by creating a difference in themselves and knowing the capacity of their condition, of getting treatment, and of getting help. I want to thank you so very much. Please, when you have an opportunity, if you're not doing it right now, please go to the betteryouknow.org campaign and you'll learn a lot more about our resources. It's free and it's an opportunity for you also to share others and empower yourself. I want to thank you so much for this time and for you know taking the time to actually learn not just about all of these treatments and uh, you know about different types of bleeding disorders but also to know about the Better You Know campaign. Thank you so very much.
Thank you, John. That was really informative about our Better You Know work. Um, uh, motivational. We all better go do something now. John told us so. Um, but I think that's really, we, we all can do something here. That's why you all probably came to the session today to learn a little bit more and figure out what is my role in this. And it might be, you know, sharing something with a friend that, hey, wait, they've told me about some of these symptoms. Maybe I can just pass some of this on. I mean, there's simple ways to get involved. And the other thing I will just point out um, as our lone male panelist here. We have men are our partners in this. This is a session that's about women and girls, but absolutely we're not in this alone. And we need everybody to help, you know, spread the word um, and improve quality of life and better outcomes for women and girls. We're not in this alone. This takes takes community. And as you saw in one of those images, um, one of the better you know advocates is a man as well. So we really in, really encourage everybody to join in with all of this. So with that, I am excited to pass this off to another one of our partners the Hemophilia Federation of America, who we also know is doing a lot of really important work um, specific to women and girls in the community and those who are undiagnosed. So I'm very excited to be introducing um, Janet Chupka, the Research Director at Hemophilia Federation of America. Thanks, Janet. Thanks, Kate. And um, I want to just thank NHF, too, for the, for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'm really excited to tell you about the work we've been doing um, with women in the bleeding disorders community through our Females in Research Sharing and Translation, or FIRST project. Um, it's funded through a PCORI Eugene Washington Engagement Award. I have no disclosures. And just to provide some background, um, in our previous PCORI-funded work, HFA's PRIDE project, we focused on the training and education and engagement of the bleeding disorders community and stakeholders um, in patient-centered outcomes research and comparative effectiveness research. And as we learned from the PRIDE project, while we see a lot of medical advances occurring in the community as a whole, um, women often report being underrepresented in, in uh, research endeavors. But despite this, um, a large number of women indicated through our PRIDE project that they would be interested in engaging in research if they were given the opportunity. So based on this knowledge, we created our first project. Um, Patient-centered outcomes research is truly centered around the patient, and in this case, the women of our community. And this approach to research allows women to be engaged throughout the entire process, um, from development of the study itself to the reporting of information back to the community. So um, HFA created the first project with the objective of gaining a better understanding of the current levels of research engagement and then to identify gaps in participation in research for females in the bleeding disorders community. The long-term objective of the project is to increase female influence and engagement in research development, implementation, and dissemination of results which ultimately affects clinical care for females with bleeding disorders and then potentially other rare diseases. Um, so what did we do? We're just wrapping up um, the first year of our project. It's a two-year project. Um, we created a focus group uh, moderator's guide that we had tested out by our community prior to use. Um, and then we created a similar guide for community stakeholders um, to gain their insight as well. We conducted four focus group sessions with women at um, local member organizations. And then we also conducted one focus group session with women over Zoom. Um, and finally, we conducted um, semi-structured semi -structured interviews with um, six uh, community stakeholders that represented industry. Um, there were healthcare providers, clinical researchers, and then leaders of other nonprofits um, in the bleeding disorder sector. So our patient participation, um, as I previously mentioned, we um, are in year one or just finished year one, and that really focused around listening to women in the community um, to gain their thoughts and perspective about the, their engagement in research. Um, so we had our four focus group sessions. One was in um, Puerto Rico. The second one we held in New Mexico. Um, the third was in the D.C. metro area. The fourth one was in Virginia. And the last session, um, as I mentioned, was held virtually over Zoom. And a total of 34 women um, participated in these sessions. So prior to attending the focus group sessions, we asked the participants to complete two surveys um, to give us a better understanding of their background and their bleeding history. Um, 24 of the women completed uh, a self-bleeding 
um, assessment tool or self-BATS, and then a quality of life survey. The most common um, bleeding disorder reported by the women who participated was hemophilia A at just about 50%, um, followed by VWD, hemophilia B, and then other rare disorders. And then as you can see, the majority of the women were under age 40. Um, about 70% of them were white, 12% black, and most of the women um, chose the U.S. and Puerto Rico as their country of origin. As far as their bleeding history, uh, 27 women responded to the self-bat. 75% um, of them reported having suffered from nosebleeds, and about 85% of the women had unexplained bruising. Um, 20 women answered the questions about menstrual bleeding, and the, the majority of those women have experienced heavy menstrual bleeding, with more than half of the women also indicating that they um, have needed to stay home from work or school more than twice a year because of heavy bleeding. So what did we learn? Not really too surprising. Um, when asked if, if they had ever been invited to participate in research or clinical trials, almost all of the women reported that they had not. Um, some said they had been invited to participate in market research or had male children who were asked to participate in research studies, but the women themselves were not. Um, and many felt that they just weren't eligible for studies, and there were not enough studies that specifically addressed women with bleeding disorders. Um, there were a variety of reasons the women gave for the lack of participation in research, um, and they included um, burden of participation. So this included um, financial burden, which um, would be a cost to travel to study locations, having to pay for parking, um, and the loss of hours at work or school. Um, also, um, having to leave home and be away from spouses and children, and then finding childcare while they were participating in the study. Um, and then also um, treatment-related burdens, such as fear of unknown treatments, and then not wanting to add to an already overburdened treatment regimen. Um, they also reported lack of available studies. Um, and most of the women felt that the studies that are available are focused on men and children and that the parameters that automatically exclude women who don't have a diagnosis. So um, many women also said they, um, they kind of expressed difficulty with defining their place in the bleeding disorders community because they feel like they might not bleed as much as um, other people they know or because they aren't um, able to get a, an official diagnosis. Um, also, gaps in care and lack of provider knowledge. So many. Women feel there is a lack of coordination um, of care for women with bleeding disorders and that providers don't have um, adequate knowledge or receive enough training on bleeding disorders in women. And finally, um, there's a lack of trust between patient and provider. Um, and this barrier to participation was actually brought up in every single focus group. Um, the women described that they feel like they're not heard by their providers or their symptoms are not taken seriously and that automatically prevents their um, providers from informing them of research studies um, because they wouldn't qualify for them. So overall, um, the women did express many concerns and barriers for participating in bleeding disorders research. However, the barriers don't indicate an unwillingness to participate um, in research by the women, but um, I do think it's essential for researchers and the medical community to be aware of and address these barriers um, in order to successfully ob obtain large pools of participants in clinical trials and research studies. So then what are some of the things the women thought would help facilitate their engagement and inclusion um, in research? Um, and they said legacy for future generations. So the women really shared that um, something that would motivate them is um, focus largely on their ability to contribute to novel research. Um, that may improve quality of life for women with bleeding disorders. Some women really felt a sense of responsibility toward the female bleeding disorders population and stated that the ability to help their daughters and granddaughters or future women with bleeding disorders would really motivate them to get involved. Um, and then other women preferred more tangible motivators such as monetary compensation for missed work um, or for time and travel. So what did they think that researchers and organizations can do to help um, get them engaged in the research process? And the first thing um, is improved communication. So really improving that relationship between um, 
The researcher and the participant was one suggestion that was discussed across multiple focus groups. The women want researchers and providers to really listen more to them and respect them and realize that they're just as important as um, males. Um, other suggestions that they had included um, having the research take place at convenient locations such as HTCs or even um, at events where the women are likely to be such as, um, you know, NHS uh, meeting or HFA symposium. Um, they suggested free child care. Um, and then having the, the eligibility and parameters spelled out really clearly um, beforehand so they know whether or not they'll be included in a study. Um, expanding age requirements to include older women, um, older than 35. Um, being clear about how their information will be used. Communicating the results of the research back to the participants and then having research focused on underserved communities such as people with VWD or um, the more rare bleeding disorders. Um, another suggestion was to be more inclusive in research, um, especially of racial minorities and those who speak languages other than English. Um, and there was a suggestion to make research more of a family affair um, by inviting um, moms and sisters and aunts and grandmothers to um, all participate in the study together. Um, some of the recruitment strategies they suggested were um, posting flyers in providers' offices and then targeting mothers of boys who've been diagnosed with bleeding disorders as there's a chance that they themselves might have one but um, be unaware that women can be diagnosed with bleeding disorders. Um, they also felt very strongly about the importance of the dissemination of the results back to the study participants so that um, it would show them the impact of their participation in research and then encourage future participation. So as I said, we did um, uh, want to get the perspective of some of the stakeholders in the community. Um, so we did six semi-structured interviews with um, community stakeholders. And again, those were people from um, the pharmaceutical industry, healthcare providers, clinical researchers, and then um, leaders of other nonprofits. And most of the stakeholders said that they had worked with women in the bleeding disorders community in clinical research or education, but they're concerned with the lack of engagement of women in research. Um, and some of the reasons the stakeholders gave that they felt why women weren't engaging in research was um, that possibly there's not enough medical evidence to understand the differences between men and women with bleeding disorders. Um, the lack of diagnosis in, of women, um, impact on quality of life, the stigma associated or potential stigma associated with bleeding disorders um, and bleeding patterns with women, um, the fact that there's um, precedence for oncology funding versus um, bleeding disorder funding, and then just um, if there's a clinician's interest in, in doing research in women. <clears throat> So some of the ideas um, that the, the stakeholders gave um, for ways to overcome those barriers um, would be to increase education for, for providers um, about bleeding disorders, um, increasing advocacy efforts, highlighting that the women's needs are not being met, um, of course, increased funding for research for women with bleeding disorders, uh, increasing communication about research opportunities, um, and they felt this could be easily done during appointments with providers, um, having unconscious bias training, and then generating data and better dissemination um, of it to scientific and general audiences. So we asked both groups um, about their interest in engaging in, a re in research that focused on women, and there was very strong support um, from both women and stakeholders um, in working together um, to increase engagement in research. Um, we also asked the women what considerations they would need to be able to participate in research opportunities. Um, and again, the economic compensation came up, so um, payment for travel um, or for time loss from work or school. Um, multiple women also mentioned it would be easiest if the research could be conducted on weekends. Um, to avoid um, or to alleviate work or school interruptions. And then many women required plenty of advance notice um, and dates 
um, with dates and times of research opportunities so that they have enough time to adjust to their schedules. And again, a few women with young children really um, felt the need for childcare to be able to fully participate in research opportunities. So we asked each group as well what some of their um, interests were in topics for research. Um, the women provided um, their thoughts on improved quality of life, uh, research around diagnosis and treatment, um, and then around the areas of mental health, joint health, reproductive health, and aging. And the stakeholders were really um, interested in just overall women's health and issues, um, surveillance and mortality trends, gender differences in treatment, and then just overall research in hemophilia, von Willebrand disease, and rare bleeding disorders. So what are our next steps? Um, we're excited to be moving on to um, year two of this award. We really felt like we learned a lot in year one and we're excited to take it to the next level. Um, so we've now turned our focus to bringing women and stakeholders together with the formation of a community-based research network. Um, the, the selection of um, these community, uh, the research members will be through an application uh, process. And once that occurs um, and, and the network members are selected, the community stakeholders um, and the community patients will come together and outline their goals and meet on a regular basis um, to be educated on the needs as determined by that group. And they'll begin the conversation, development, and outline of projects that are focused on and increase the engagement of women in research um, with the ultimate goal of improving the quality of life for women in the bleeding disorders community. So we're really excited to bring um, this group together and move it from, you know, um, learning and ideas into actual progress, uh, to an actual project. So with that, I um, thank you again for the opportunity um, to share about this work we're doing. And if anybody has any questions, um, they, uh, about this project or any work that HFA is doing, um, you can email us at research at hemophiliafed.org. So thank you again. Anna, thank you so much. Um, it was really exciting to hear about, you know, really that collaboration of both the patient and other stakeholder sides coming together and actually seeing some gaps that all that isn't necessarily aligning. That's the work we all are coming together to do now, sharing that so we can all improve and have more research on women, definitely being out in the field. I hear it all the time. Well, we just don't know what the difference is between women and men or women feeling like their voices aren't being heard in that process. So thank you for sharing those results. It's really exciting and, and into your next steps. So thank you for that. Um, and with that, we will go on to our next speaker. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Kay Strotter, JD, MSW from the Regional Women's Health. Um, she's a Regional Women's Health Analyst um, and from the Health and Human Services Department. So we're really excited to have you here, Kay, to be able to talk about women's bleeding disorders and public health, achieving success through with regional HHS partners. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for this opportunity to uh, share with you uh, information about uh, the regional offices and our ability as federal partners to help support women's bleeding disorders. Uh, I'm looking forward to this and um, certainly am uh, honored to be amongst a group of people who are very uh, passionate about this issue. I don't have any disclosures. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, the mission of the uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services regional offices uh, and where we're located and who some of the regional leaders are who can assist with helping women uh, or, or programs and activities that address women with uh, blood disorders. So the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services uh, is the, one of the largest departments in the federal government. We uh, receive 25% of all federal funding each year that um, is uh, appropriated by Congress. We have 11 agencies and 14 offices. We operate more than 300 programs. And our mission is to protect the health of all Americans and provide essential human services uh, for those who are least able to help themselves. 
within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services is the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, and that is headed by uh, the Assistant Secretary for Health, Admiral Brett Jouar, who's pictured here. Uh, and I also included a picture of my supervisor, uh, Commander Matthew Johns, who's head of the region. He's the Regional Health Administrator for Region 9. So the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health uh, is focused on leading America to healthier lives, and we are we have eight offices that are involved in that: the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, uh, the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV/AIDS Policy, the Office of Human Research and Protections, the Office of Minority Health, and the Office on Women's Health, the Office of the Surgeon General, the Office of Research Integrity, and the Office of Population Affairs. The Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health also includes the 10 regional offices in the department that are scattered across the country. So staff are actually located uh, closer to you than Washington, D.C. And those regional offices are located, uh, Region 1 is in Boston, Region 2 is in New York City, Region 3 is in Philadelphia, Region 4 is in Atlanta, Region 5 is in Chicago, 6 is in Dallas, 7 is in Kansas City, 8 is in Denver, 9 is in San Francisco, and 10 is in Seattle. And my office is located in Region 9 in San Francisco, and we include Arizona, California, Nevada, Hawaii, and six Pacific Island jurisdictions, going from American Samoa out to Guam. So what we do uh, in the regional offices is foster coordination and collaboration around priority areas. We serve as spokespersons, as I'm doing today, and we ensure that the priorities are better uh, incorporated at local, state, and national levels. We do that by developing and implementing strategic plans, we share policies and programs, practices, research, funding activities. So we get information and we share that with our listservs, with our newsletters, in our briefings, in um, updates, uh, on webinars, uh, using our social media, whether it's YouTube or Twitter, uh, through press releases and so forth. And uh, we share that with the people who are in our networks, and then we receive information from people such as yourselves who say, we want to let you know that in your region this particular activity is going on, or we're going to be hosting a webinar, we're going to be doing a training session, and we'd love people to apply for that. One of the other things that we do is, uh, is we make connections. We know people who know people. And so there's n almost nothing having to do with public health or women and girls where we don't know people that we can connect you with. Uh, we do convenings and meetings. And in fact, uh, the person who's going to be speaking after me, Dr. Baker, will be sharing with you about how she connected with our office and how we began to work to, to develop and have established a relationship over time where we uh, share stakeholders, we get the people to the table that maybe you can't get to the table, um, and uh, work to increase the uh, impact that we can all have in addressing some of these issues. And then we also inform public health um, decision making. Uh, sometimes people contact us because they want to know about uh, what what would be the best way to uh, tackle an issue, what are some evidence-based models uh, or promising practices in a particular area, uh, like the, uh, uh, the, the, the clinic that Dr. Haley was talking about. And so we would share that information with them uh, to help them make it, their decisions about how to best um, uh, put funding out uh, or, or request uh, support. This is a list of the uh, regional women's health analysts across the country in every single region. And I wanted to share that with you because um, 
Women and Girls Health is scattered throughout the, the Department of Health and Human Services. And if you find the uh, Women's Health Analyst who is in your region, she will be able to help navigate through the different federal agencies and programs in terms of helping you to find exactly who you want to meet with or talk to uh, or share information with. There are a lot of potential federal partners that are located, who are in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, who are actually located in the regions. Uh, the Administration for Children and Families has a lot of uh, programs that have to do with uh, women and girls. The Administration for Community Living focuses on older women uh, and also those who are disabled. Of course, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, if you look at the Food and Drug Administration, they also do a lot of work uh, on women and girls' health. And their materials can be found in a variety of languages. The Health Resources and Services Administration has an Office of Women's Health, uh, as do some of the others, uh, for example, the Food and Drug Administration but they also have, um, they support all of the community and migrant health centers across the country, the federally qualified ones, and their sources uh, for places to get health care if people don't have uh, uh, a doctor or um, insurance. We also have the Indian Health Service, and then we have the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which can also help with a lot of uh, gender-based issues in terms of services uh, and um, treatment. So that's my presentation for today. I hope that you will feel free to contact me directly if you have any questions or you need assistance. Uh, I'm happy to navigate you, to refer you, and to support you in what you do. We're very much concerned about prevention and education, and we want to do everything we can to uh, make sure that you get exactly what you need in terms of resources to um, support your program. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much for that. I think to really be able to see that on a national level, all of the different resources available, um, knowing that women are coming into this, women and girls from so many different perspectives, especially if there's underdiagnosis, right, to actually get women into the system, that will probably take, you know, various different entry points and really that if we are looking at this holistically, it really takes a lot of those resources. So thank you for sharing those. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Judith Baker, uh, DRPH MHSA from the Hemophilia Treatment Center Network um, in Region 9, the Western States, and the Pacific Sickle Cell Regional Collaborative from the Center for Inherited Blood Disorders. Um, thank you for being here today, Judith has always been really focused on bringing that public health perspective um, in our partnership with NHF, so we're really excited to have you on talking about women, blood disorders, and public health, achieving success with regional HHS partners. I'll hand it over to you. Well, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here with everybody. So I want to thank Kay and all the other speakers for all of their wonderful work. Um, it's just been remarkable to hear what everybody's doing and uh, to bring you into some of my world, which is a public health um, that really, I think, touches on everything that everybody else has been so wonderfully describing. Uh, we have no disclosures, and I wanted to let you know that our, the learning objective that we're going to focus on in this uh, presentation was really in partnership with Kay, and we've been partners for quite some time. And my focus today will be to help folks understand how one region, ours in the Western states, successfully engaged with our regional HHS partners to do three things, to build blood disorders, clinical services, to stimulate some clinical workforce development across the blood disorders, and to raise blood disorders awareness nationally. So the framework that I use is the 10 essential public health services, and each of the speakers mentioned and focused on one of these areas. Um, research is always in the middle of everything that we do in systems management. Um, we monitor health, we diagnose and investigate, we inform, educate, we empower, 
You mobilize community partnerships, develop policies, enforce laws, link and provide people to care. We assure a competent workforce and we evaluate. And that's something that we do. All of the speakers here are involved in public health in one way or another. Uh, this is a work that we've done together to develop a dashboard. Um, the work that we're, I'm going to focus on today is women's bleeding disorders in the context of sickle cell disease and hemophilia. And you know, this is your stoplight of red, there's problems, uh, yellow, there's some issues, and green, we're doing fairly well. And the work that we've been doing in hemophilia and sickle cell disease really do have a lot of shared concerns. Um, we share problems on the individual patient level with pain. These are both chronic disorders, the spontaneous and acute bleeding and blood um, crises. There's a lot of emergency room and hospitalizations that can occur that it could be avoided if there were good systems built around them. There's work in school loss and all of the other things you see here are shared. They are, however, in sickle cell disease, much more severe in terms of health disparities because sickle cell disease primarily affects African-Americans as well as Hispanics. So when we think about improving services for women's bleeding disorders, sickle cell disease, thalassemia, hemophilia, von Willebrand disease, we both share the problems of there being a lack of severe shortage of knowledgeable providers. With all the speakers that you've heard before, very few clinicians are knowledgeable about women's blood disorders, women's bleeding disorders, VWD, same thing with sickle cell disease. Surveillance at a national level, thankfully we're doing very well in hemophilia. We could always do better, but there's never been national surveillance in sickle cell. There is a treatment center network nationally for hemophilia for over 30 years, but no such thing exists in sickle cell, and that's something that we're trying to create. But something that's unique in sickle cell and hemophilia is that we share the same clinicians. Physicians who are trained in hematology, you know, board certified, they know how to take care of folks with hemophilia and blood and sickle cell disease. So they're in many places at a hemophilia treatment center, they are, take, they are the same team taking care of folks with sickle cell disease and the women. On the insurance level in public health, it's a battle for reimbursement and access to knowledgeable clini clinical care. In terms of building community-based organizations, hemophilia has had more resources in general over the years, many more than sickle cell disease. So you'll have a stronger infrastructure for community-based organizations. And at the level of resources in general, hemophilia has, can always do better, but it's fared much better than sickle cell disease. So that's a public health framework and, and what you might consider a, da a dashboard of where we are from a public health perspective. Well, I've had the benefit of working um, intermittently, but very positively for many years with our HHS partners in Region 9 and even the, re the neighboring partners. And I wanted to give you some of the highlights of our successes addressing some of the health barriers that I just identified. Taking you back all the way to the mid-90s when we needed to develop hemophilia services in the U.S. Pacific, some of the work that we did shortly thereafter with von Willebrand disease and women's health education, then moving forward about, well, gosh, many years to sickle cell disease and strengthening the workforce, particularly for Hispanics populations who are affected, then refugee health, and moving on to national sickle cell awareness. I would like to talk a bit about the um, regional networks for hemophilia care. This is really a treasure that we have as a rare disorder. Um, we have been organized as regions for, well, since 1990 was when regionalization was mandated by CDC and HRSA. Um, I work in the Western states, Region 9, the red region. Um, and these regions pretty much, not totally, but pretty much align with the regions that Kate showed you, which I'll reflect on again. Um, and the map on the right, all those stars are individual hemophilia treatment centers as of 2005. Um, and individual patients and color-coded to match the actual HTCs. And right now there's 150 federally supported hemophilia treatment centers in the U.S. Hemophilia Treatment Center Network. But what if you live in Guam? What if you live in one of these six U.S. Pacific jurisdictions? And as you can see, you know, here's Japan. And Guam is right below it. Um, here's the Midway Islands. Here's Hawaii. You know, Los Angeles, uh, where I'm based in Southern California. This is 
it's 18 hours ahead. When it's 3 p.m. in Los Angeles, it's um, 9 a.m. the next day in Guam in general. So in terms of developing services, reaching out to your counterparts, talking to them, these are things that we always need to be um, taking into account. So how do we do this? Well, I knew of the regional offices um, because I actually knew about them back, believe it or not, in the 1980s when I was doing some work in Philadelphia where there is an HH office uh, working for the Philadelphia Department of Public Health. And when I moved out to California and we were told that the US Pacific was our responsibility, I contacted Kay and the Office of Pacific Health Director in San Francisco and they said, well, I think a, a great thing to do would be to, you know, I knew we had to create a survey to find the physicians who had patients, who had people that had either suspected or diagnosed hemophilia and von Willebrand's disease. So how do I find those physicians? And that's where the office, the HHS office, Region 9, Kay and her counterparts were very helpful. They were the individuals who knew about something called PHOA, for example. PHOA is the Pacific Islander Health Officer Association. So they linked us to PHOA and they helped us promote the survey. They had lists of physicians. They had lists of the um, islands, uh, departments of health and social services. They were critical in getting this survey that we did out to all of those potential physicians. We sent out 200 surveys. We got about um, 40 back. And that's where we found that most of the physicians who were, had patients or with suspected or diagnosed hemophilia and von Willebrand's were located in Guam, and we had the actual names. So that's why we started developing local hemophilia expertise in Guam itself. And females with bleeding disorders was one of our top priorities. And the individual here on the left in the pink, that is the late Renee Paper, who was a nurse with uh, von Willebrand's disease, and she founded the Hemophilia Foundation of Nevada, and, as she's also an ER nurse. And I sent Renee out to the Pacific Islands, and Kay let us know that there was um, an Asian Pacific Islander nurse educating, educator conference and just in time to send Renee out to Palau, which she had to find on her globe. And that started off our educating all of the nurses in the Pacific Islands about women's bleeding disorders. And that, but it wasn't a one-off. We've been going out to Guam and Guam has been coming out to us more frequently for over the past 20 years. And we just celebrated our 20th anniversary of the Hemophilia Treatment Center in Guam. And we also developed some services in Saipan that I'll tell you about. And this is one of our young boys who was actually not allowed to go to school because he had head bleeds spontaneously, and here he is at age 13 learning how to self-infuse. And here he is again a few years later at Guam's own summer hemophilia camp showing um, the nurses his excellent technique. So every year that um, we are able to send somebody out to the Pacific, we try to connect them with the Pacific Islander Nurse Association so they can spread the word about women's bleeding disorders. We also educate the school nurses about girls with bleeding disorders. We educate the public health nurses, patients and families, the health department leaders. And more recently, we have a partnership with um, one of our treatment centers, UC San Francisco. They have one of the physicians there actually went out to Saipan for several years as part of her um, medical training. And um, we know that the folks in Saipan love soccer. So we did a week-long series about educating the islanders, the patients, the families, as well as soccer coaches and nurses and nurse practitioners and OBs and dentists about von Willebrand disease because the girls like to play as well as the boys. And at the end of that week, long series, we had the soccer coaches who are now more educated become the staff, the volunteer staff of the weekend camp. And we wrote about that and got it published in the American Journal of Public Health. So some of the lesson is this, is the HHS offices linked us to other key leaders who then we convinced um, to adopt hemophilia, girls, women with blood disorders as their priority. And so it's not just us alone in our own world trying to find other partners. The partners are there and it's the linkages that Kay and her colleagues fostered that help us really build our bridges. So that's just a mere taste of some of our work in blood disorders and hemophilia and von Willebrand's disease that help raise awareness about women and girls in very far distant places. 
I'm going to switch real quickly now to sickle cell disease. I mentioned that hemophilia has been regionalized on the clinical care side for decades, but not so sickle cell. It was only in 2014 that HRSA decided to regionalize their treatment demonstration project for sickle cell. And we at the Center for Inherited Blood Disorders are the grantee for the 13-state Pacific Sickle Cell Regional Collaborative, and those are our clinical sites. And we also have community-based organizations that are our partners. There's been a lot of bridge building. And this is the, you know, if I go back for one slide, that's our region for 13 states. And that actually combines HHS regions 9, region 10, region 8, and just one state in region 6. So our partnerships with our HHS offices has expanded um, to include several of our regions. And these are all of the, or many of the, um, offices that Kay just mentioned, and we interface with them <clears throat> regularly. When we got this grant, I talked to Kay, I reached out again, and I said, oh, what do we do? How can we best work together to collaborate, to raise awareness about all the gaps in sickle cell disease that uh, we need to spread the word? And Kay said, I can't give you money. And I so appreciate that blunt, direct, but said with a smile, but we can convene. How about you have an annual meeting here in our offices where you can tell us about the needs, where you can tell us about potential strategies, where we can give you some feedback and some guidance, and in the same time, raise awareness among our counterparts. Kay mentioned all of those um, listservs that she has and educating her prior parts nationwide about what we're doing in sickle cell by coming together. And these are some of the pictures about, well, you know, here's Kay. Um, and these are some of our group um, and some of our partners that we're going to tell you about shortly. So one of the key gaps that we needed to educate Kay and the other partners about was Hispanics. Um, why Hispanics? Because very few clinicians are aware that Hispanics also are at risk for sickle cell disease. So one of the questions that I asked Kay at one of the very first meetings that I said, can you please give me one name, just one name, of a mover and shaker in the Hispanic community who can help us educate the Hispanic workforce? And, she, and um, Christina Perez, who at the time was the Office for Minority Health Consultant in Region 9, said, absolutely. And she gave me a name, and we contacted them, and lo and behold, a partnership took off like lightning that we've had for the past several years. And this is with a group called this, the National Association of Hispanic Nurses. So why nurses? Well, nurses are primarily women. By educating his nurses, you educate women about sickle cell and other blood disorders, and they themselves can educate the Hispanic community. And these are just some of the highlights of our partnership with um, what they call non, um, and this is the Los Angeles chapter. But over the years, well, non immediately developed sickle cell disease as a priority, and sickle cell disease affects males and females equally. So in terms of educating and raising awareness, raising clinical workforce to address the needs for women's blood disorders, this is one of our routes. So non immediately invited us to their conferences to educate their membership not just the Los Angeles chapter, but chapters throughout California. The non chapter in LA added us to their federal grant, their Office of Minority Health grant to educate um, communities, multicultural communities about ACA enrollment. So together we created a very simple slideshow about sickle cell and Hispanics that we, we gave, that non leaders gave in English and Spanish to health fairs and really educated folks that we would never have been able to reach out to. Not also create uh, committed operational resources to this endeavor. And most recently, last year, we held, um, we had a webinar on sickle cell equity for Hispanics for, from the national office of NON, just not the LA office, but from the national office. Another linkage we had that um, Kay's office helped us out with was with African immigrant health. Uh, we learned from our Washington uh, clinical lead that, as well as Tucson, that there are many immigrant and refugee centers in our West 13 Western states. But, and a lot of those um, 
immigrants are from African communities and also from South American communities who are at risk for sickle cell disease. But those recent immigrants, um, they did not know that sickle cell disease was treatable. Mostly, oftentimes, children with sickle cell disease in many African countries die very young. But if we could link those immigrant um, health officers, the state immigrant and refugee health coordinators to our centers of excellence, we could help improve access for women and girls with sickle cell disease. So it was actually the Region 10 office, uh, Gary Gant, who let us know that they were, and put us in touch with folks who invited us to be plenary speakers at two African immigrant um, health conferences, one in the Northwest region and then a, a US conference. A second thing we did was we learned that um, French is often read by many of the uh, people who come from some African countries. So we encouraged the CDC to translate some of their sickle cell disease patient focusing fact sheets and brochures into French. And we were thrilled that they did that right before, like the week before we uh, gave our presentations at these 2016 conferences. And it's up there today at the, uh, on the CDC website. If you just public, um, do a search on CDC Sickle Cell French, you'll find those materials as well as in um, Spanish. And also Kay's office helped link us to these offices of refugee resettlement. And we've had several um, good discussions with the state refugee health coordinators. None of this would not have happened if we didn't have this wonderful partnership with HHS regions. And moving forward, we are really thrilled that Kay's office um, offered to sponsor a series of weekly webinars on sickle cell disease back in 2018 in conjunction with Sickle Cell Awareness Month. And I give this as an example. This is something that we could, you know, partnering um, out there, we could consider for von Willebrand's disease or women's bleeding disorders. And we are, um, Kay's group also committed to doing this again in 2020. So we're really excited about that. So uh, in summary, I wanted to briefly reflect on partnerships that work. Um, I'm sure that many of you have tried to be partners with other groups and it hasn't gone as well. And then you have examples of partnerships that really do work well and that are meaningful. And these are some of the elements that I've found over the years that really work, that there's mutual commitment, there's a common agenda, there's structure, there's a recognition that of what the expectations are. And I'll bring up again when Kay said, we can't give you money, but we can convene. I said, okay, that's, that's helpful to having a very um, positive and re mutually reinforcing partnership. The, the tasks fit the best qualified individuals that you communicate openly. You share both the ups and downs. Um, and the value is just insurmountable. Um, we can really bridge some insurmountable gaps and you feel you're very alone with women's bleeding disorders. I've been doing this for many years. Um, it really expands reach to have another good partner agency adopt our priorities as their priorities. And that's what the HHS offices can do. So I want to actually you know, thank everybody um, because it takes a team. I'm a spokesperson, but there's this, I'm surrounded by and lifted by all the folks that I work with. Um, in our collaborative, in the HHS offices, the Sickle Cell Disease Foundation, the Hispanic Nurse Association, all the hemophilia treatment centers, the NHF and HFA chapters um, are involved, um, and the front line, everybody on the front lines doing this work. So that's, um, I'll just take a breath and say that's what I'm hoping that you gain some encouragement, that there's really hope um, to build bridges, to advance the cause for women, with blood disorders and bleeding disorders. Um, I've been asked by NHF, we popped this um, slide in that there is an evaluation. The evaluation is absolutely critical to what we do um, on behalf of, you know, Kay, you know, she'll come on too later, but I want to thank you for your time listening and hoping that you are spurred to action to build bridges with some of these wonderful partners. So I'll hand it back to you, Kay. Thank you so much, Judith. That was really, I think, a great way to wrap this whole conversation today um, to really look at partnership. 
that's why we wanted to bring everybody together. And I hope everybody's coming out with some ideas and next steps about what we might be able to do together. And now we have some, you know, examples and a framework for how to potentially do that well, and that we can really, you know, raise the bar for all by doing this work together. So thank you for that those ideas. I wrote a bunch down myself. Um, as people are filling out the evaluation, um, we'll have links to that, but I also just encourage any of our viewers, our participants, to write into the chat any last minute questions or comments, feedback, ideas that you have, um, and our speakers will be able to stay on for a minute or two and um, be able to respond to any last minute questions there. Um, as Judith had mentioned, um, we do have the evaluation and we are doing a raffle for it. So if you participate, um, there's a daily raffle of $75, a little gift card, because those that feedback really does matter. We want to continue to develop better programming in the future. So give us those ideas and that feedback. Um, so just in closing, thank you to all of our panelists. This has been hugely insightful to hear about this, um, you know, the broader scope of blood disorders overall and specifically around, you know, women, adolescents and girls. Um, and what does this look like? What are the common, you know, issues women and girls are facing regardless if the actual disorders are quite different. A lot around diagnosis and underdiagnosis, about access to care and treatment, about being heard from providers, um, about new and innovative ways that we can approach some of this together, about research and what else is left to be heard and what else is left to be done. So I hope everybody um, can walk away with something inspiring um, that they can take and think they can start to work on or do. And I really appreciate and want to thank all of our panelists again for your time um, and your expertise. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.